We need multiple victims to get multiple millions. We need something precious. The state will be willing to pay a big, big ransom. Let's pick someone who doesn't fight back. Someone vulnerable. Imagine you're going through a routine part of your day. Doing something simple you do every day at the same time. It's second nature, you're not even thinking about it. But what if you were forced to think about it? Because the thing you're doing is about to be interrupted and within minutes, you'll find yourself in a situation you could never have dreamed of in a million years. A situation of life or death. Well, that's exactly what happened here to 27 different people. Welcome to Extraordinary Stories Podcast. are you? Are you well? Are you good? I am. I must just say hello to any new listeners. I know there's a fair few of you out there, so hello, welcome along. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been it's been a lovely week actually because there was a sort of celebration this week, which which was nice on the Facebook group because the Facebook group's been running for three years. And so it was nice to just see people sort of celebrating the lovely community that it is. So thanks for that. Uh, the story tonight, I'm just going to say a quick shout out to Sarah Dai, who uh, sent me this story. And I didn't know this one. I just flat out didn't know it. And it's so bizarre because when you go through it, you're like, how did I not know this one? Maybe some of you true crime uh, extreme fans out there might know this one, but it's new to me. Okay, um, yeah, it's the, I'm going to call this the not shout out, in fact, is what I'm going to call this. So, at uh, David Gelub, I'm going to go with Gelub, I think it's Gelub. David sent me a message on Instagram, addressing the message, Dear Alfie. <laughs> I mean, no mention of me. I mean, you're just taking the piss now, aren't you? This is just taking the piss. I've had a few of these this week. <laughs> Dear Alfie, and in brackets... Barry, I mean, just remember, I'm the star of the show, okay? David, my darling, I just deleted your message. Cut you dead. Don't want to hear from you ever again. No, I'm kidding. Of course I didn't. Of course I didn't do that. David got in touch to say that him and his wife have a really lovely ritual in which they sit in their garden every Sunday at four o'clock and they listen together to an episode. Yes, the lovely garden in Ireland. How lovely. Oh, I should really give them an Irish accent. So David said, We're all we're caught up on the podcast, Barry. So what we do is we just listen to one at random. There we go. Well, thanks, David, for getting in touch. Right, let's get on with the story. Let's call this meeting to order. Are you ready for a story which, when it happened, would be the first of its kind and become one of the most talked about cases for years to come. Okay, let's go.
Right, have you ever sat around with your friends or a group of people and thought, you know what, I've got a great plan. I mean, I'm sure lots of people have. I mean, in a way, it's the way that things are created. It's probably the way that big businesses came to be or big cultural movements came to be. It all started from a group of people where someone went, you know, I have a very good idea. Like, you know, um, what's his coom? Uh, what's his face? You know, Facebook guy. He must have at some point just been sitting around and thought, you know what the world needs? It needs a way to connect. And he came up with Facebook. What else? What else? I'm trying to think. I'm looking round. Oh, this. Exactly. This. True crime podcasts. Someone, somebody, somewhere one day went, do you know what people really want to hear? They really want to hear murder. They really want to hear crime in their ears all the live long day. And it's how things come to be. Often money is the big driver. So picture this, if you will. It's 1975 and three guys are sitting together in a bar. And they're having a chat about ways to make money. Fast. A uh, get-rich-quick scheme, <laughs> if you will. Don't know if that phrase is still about, but that's what they were. That's what they were looking for. So where are they? Well, they're in California, where everyone talks like this. Hey, I'm from California. Hello. So these three guys, who are going to be our villains of the story, are... Fred Woods, who's 24 years old, and two of his friends, James and Richard Schoenfield, who are brothers. Sounds German, that surname. I'm, I'm not sure it is. Anyway. So we have Fred Woods, or to give him his full name, Frederick Newell Woods, the fifth. Well, I think it's the fifth. It's those Roman numerals. You know, when it's the one and then it's the V. Does that mean five, the fifth? Or is that the fourth? Maybe it's the sixth. Maybe I need to go and check my Roman numerals. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, Frederick Newell Woods, the something, Roman numerally. What we need to know about Fred is that he comes from a very, very wealthy family. His father owns huge amount of businesses across the part of California that they live in. They live in the Central Valley part where I think there's money to be made or there certainly was in the 1970s. And so Fred sort of comes from this like big kind of wealthy town where, you know, all the all the houses were all owned by business owners and people lived a pretty peachy life with, you know, constant stream of money coming from their parents. So, as I said, he's 24, but here's the thing. He's been an absolute douchebag with his money up until this point. Any money that he gets given by his mother or his father, he just squanders it. He's got absolutely zero control of how to look after money. So he constantly finds himself skint. Now, the two brothers that he's with, James and Richard, well... They're kind of in a similar position. They actually come from quite wealthy parents as well. They went to a nice school. And they're 22 years old at the time. But much like Fred, they are bobbins at keeping control of their cash. It's the, it's the crazy 1975 lifestyle, isn't it? They're just always out of money. Probably spending it, <laughs> I would guess, on hair product. Judging by the photos of these three guys, my God. If I said to you right now, close your eyes, and I want you to picture three men from the early, mid-1970s. They're criminals in this story. Whatever you're seeing, whatever that vision is, it's exactly right. They're, they've got the slightly too big glasses, the sort of long hair that's almost like a bob, denim shirts, you know the vibe. So here they are, they're sitting in this bar and they're thinking how can they earn money fast? 
And they start to discuss what are the ways that people have done this before. So they think, bank robbery. Hmm. It's a bit risky. Bank robberies don't tend to end well, they discuss. Blackmail is another option. They could find out some dirt on one of their, you know, parents' wealthy business friends. They could go down that road. Again, it's messy. Generally tends to end up with people being caught. Then, after hours and hours of more talking and more drinking in the bar, they arrive at the answer they're looking for. Kidnap someone and get a huge ransom. I mean, it's not the first, nor will it be the last time that someone thinks that kidnapping is a good idea to get rich. But here's the difference. This wasn't just going to be your run-of-the-mill kidnapping. This was going to be big. The three men decide they don't want to just rush in to this. They need time to think time to plan. A kidnapping like they're planning needs preparation. So they've got the the what. They know what they're going to do. Now they need the when. When are they going to do it? Well, they're thinking, let's give ourselves a year. Let's take a year to plan this. Then they start thinking about the amount. How much money could they actually make from a kidnapping? Well, depends who they kidnap and that leads them to the who. And that's the biggest question of all. Who would they kidnap? And as they sit in that bar in 1975, what it comes down to for them is this. Who is so precious and so loved that if you asked for an extortionate amount of money to get them back, you would be guaranteed to get it? And an idea pops into Fred's head. He knows exactly who people will pay big money for. They're planning to ask for five million dollars in their get-rich-quick scheme. And they don't know this at the time, but what they're actually planning is one of the biggest historical cases of kidnapping ever to exist. 1976, a year later, and we're going to move to Chowchilla, 100 miles away from the part of California that we were in, but still staying in California. So we're in a town which has a really, like, strong sense of community. It's a a farming community. I think it's about 5,000 people. It's quite small, mainly farm workers, that type of thing. It's quite like a little sort of hidden town fairly quiet. Well, it was in 1976. I mean, I don't know if it may be a major city by now, but it was back then. Now, it's the summer holidays, and all the local kids are off school for weeks and weeks. And what's happened is the school board have decided that they're going to run a summer programme for kids. It's to give the parents a bit of a break and give the kids something to do during the summer holidays. Now, everyone, the kids, the parents... They love the fact that there's an activity to go to every day that the school has organised. And so school buses were employed to collect almost 180 kids from around the Couchilla area and take them to the summer programme where they could do all manner of fun activities. I loved all that when I was wee. All summer schools and all that. Sunday school, yes. Drawn pictures, singing hymns, give me all in my lamp, keep me burning, give me all in my lamp, can't you see? Remember all that? Brilliant fun. However, it's beginning to come to an end, and pretty soon, 
they're just going to go back to normal life before proper school starts back. Although, what's about to happen means that normal life won't mean normal life for this town. Let's talk about a man called Frank Edward Ray, or Mr Ray, as the kids called him. He was 55 years old. He was a local resident and he drove the school buses throughout the year. And during the summer, during these summer programmes, he'd taken on the extra work of driving the buses. Very, very popular with the kids. You know, he was so friendly to them all. He would play games with them on the bus. He would get them all singing along. Sounds like Mike and a man. Just in general, everyone loved this guy. You know, the school, all the teachers loved him. The parents liked him. Just a really nice guy. I mean, it's so interesting, isn't it? Because I think we're so conditioned now by true crime stories. It's almost like, as I was thinking about Mr Ray coming into the story, I was like, the minute you've introduced it, there's something involving kids. And then you then, the next person... I could actually, when I was thinking about how to tell the story, I was like... Oh no, if I introduce the kids and then I introduce Mr. Ray, you just immediately set up this like I don't do you know what I'm saying? It's like that that's because because we hear so many true crime stories that are like, we've got these lovely innocent kids. Here comes the fifty five year old school bus driver and it sounds dodgy, but it's not in any way. It's it's absolutely not Mr. Ray is a good guy here. I and he's gonna prove himself to be a great guy. So no offence, by the way, to any bus drivers or school bus drivers, that's, that's that's not what I meant. But you know what I'm talking about with true crime stories? It's almost like I get this when I listen to different podcasts and different stories. It's like you're almost listening for the clues and you hear the same kinds of thing over and over. So you start to pick them up and go, oh, mm, that person's going to be a murderer. <laughs> They're going to turn out to be a murderer in 10 minutes time. Oh. Oh, you've mentioned her. Oh, she's going to turn out to... You know, that kind of thing. So, on July 15th, 1976, Mr Ray is getting ready to take the kids home. It's the end of the summer programme day. So he packs 25 different kids onto the bus and just as he's about to drive off, a child that he doesn't know comes running up to the bus and wants a lift home This child's a little bit older than the rest. He is 14 years old, this boy, and he's called Michael Marshall. So the kids on the bus, like I said, there's 25 of them. The new addition of 14-year-old Michael makes 26, and Mr Ray makes the 27th person on the bus. In general, the age of the kids starts at about five. Mainly it's made up of sort of five to eight-year-olds, There's a couple of nine-year-olds, and there's a few sort of 11, 12-year-olds, but generally we're talking the young end of of the scale here. So, Mr Ray... Actually, do you know what? Hang on. I can't call the bus driver Mr Ray. I've just realised I'm not five. Why would I be calling him Mr Ray? I'm just going to call him Ray, Okay. Ray gets the bus going, and he sets off. He's driven a bit of a distance... And he now has to drive down, it's like quite a sort of narrow dirt track almost. And he he has to sort of drive down this, and he's used to it because he drives it every day, but he has to drive down this to to get him to where he needs to drop the kids off back in their their village at Couchilla. Suddenly he's stopped in his tracks. Right in front of the route the school bus is going down is a broken down van and it's completely blocking the path. So Ray looks out of his driver's window, he sees the van, he sees some guys looking into the hood, and he thinks, shit, I'm not gonna be able to drive down this road because of this broken down van. I'll go and see if they need my help. And at first, nothing looks particularly odd to him. It's three guys he can see and as he starts to make a move uh, off the bus to, to go and offer his help, one of the guys actually comes from the truck and walks up to the bus, presumably to ask for a bit of help. So Ray opens the, the bus door 
and before he knows what's happened, three men have jumped onto the bus, pointing a shotgun at Ray and telling him to move towards the back of the bus now. Ray's in complete shock. And immediately what happens is some of the older kids, they try to get out of their seats to see if there's anything that they can do, but it's as quick as lightning. These three men are on the bus and they're wearing these nylon tights over their heads to hide their faces. So there's panic and there's screaming and the younger kids have really gotten a fright. I mean, everyone's in shock, but the younger kids have really, really gotten a fright because these men are waving guns. And one of the men holds up a gun, waves it at the bus full of kids and says, shut up if you want to make it out alive. So remember those three guys sitting in that bar a year before? Fred Woods, James and Richard Schoenfield. Well, this was it. This was their big plan. This is what had taken a year of planning. It was happening right now. The plan to make their fortune. During the planning stages when they had decided it would be a kidnapping and they were trying to work out who, Fred Woods had said to the other two men, we need multiple victims to get multiple millions. And I suggest children because children are precious. The state will be willing to pay big ransom for them. Big, big money. And children, well, let's face it, they don't fight back. They're vulnerable. And on that bus, Fred Woods, the mastermind it would seem, holds a gun to Ray's head, marches him to the back of the bus and stays next to him with the gun pointed. He also orders any of the older kids to move to the back of the bus also where he can see them. What had initially happened was some of the older kids, when the, the men burst on the bus, had instantly run for some of the younger kids and they had sort of ran to sit next to them or like put their arms around them or try and shield them in, in a way. And now Fred Woods is making them all move. He's making, he wants all, he basically just wants all the older kids and Ray up the back where he's got a gun and he can see what they're up to in case anyone tries to overpower them or try anything. So James Schoenberg, he takes the driver's seat and the bus begins to move out of the dirt road. Richard, the other kidnapper, he gets back into the broken down van, the fake broken down van, and the bus is on its way to the next stage of the plan. As mad as it sounds they had spent a year planning this and it was going to be this town this bus this set of children they had stocked school buses in a lot of different bits of california to see how they might best pull this off they'd visited other bits and pieces of towns they'd watched the amount of kids they'd watched for security and it was after seeing all these locations that this is where they picked. Chowchilla was top of their list. And this level of planning, this attention to detail, is something that they will apply to other parts of their plan. Now they'd taken the bus off the main road and they had to drive through some really rocky roads and it is a bumpy, bumpy ride. Because obviously it's a stolen school bus at this point and you don't want that necessarily visible. They wanted to try and hide the bus as much as they can, so they take it through some very dodgy bits of road. Just thinking how those kids must have felt at that moment, they must have just felt terrified and awful. I also thought as well to myself, imagine being Ray at this moment, 
wonder what's going through his head. I mean, he is the adult here. He's got to be thinking, I've got a gun pointed at my head. If they kill me, then what's going to happen to these kids? Awful, just absolutely awful. After a while, the bus starts to slow down and it, it gets into a sort of dry riverbed where there's quite a lot of trees surrounding it and it stops. Now, looking at the windows of the bus, the kids, Ray, they can't really see much around them other than some trees. And the plan here really is to drive the bus out of sight, park it here and move the 27 kidnapped people. I mean, that's not easy. Moving 27 people that you've kidnapped. I mean, I've tried it and it's not easy. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm kidding. So, with the school bus stopped, what they're now going to do, the kidnappers, is they're going to get the kids and the driver off the bus by forcing them to jump into the back of two vans that they have pulled up to the back of the school bus. Get a, get a clear picture of this. Right, so you've got the school bus is stopped. They've opened the doors of it and there's two vans which they have reversed in so that the back doors of the vans are open and they want the kids to jump from the school bus into this new van. And the reason that they want them to jump is because what they didn't want is any footprints. When they left the school bus, they wanted, when it was found, for it to be found with no children's footprints round about it, which is just really creepy. Really fucking creepy. But that's what they wanted. So that's what they do. They could have marched them off the bus, they could have moved them in groups, but no. This is how they decide to do it. So they split the people who are on that bus into two different vans and they shut the doors, leaving the school bus just completely abandoned. What's the plan here then? What are they doing? Well, they decided they're going to leave the school bus behind and they're going to drive them miles away. They're going to make it really hard to be tracked, make it really difficult for police to find them. So where are police looking? at this point. Well, not not necessarily. I wouldn't I wouldn't say a massive police hunt was underway, but yeah, okay, back in Churchilla, there was a growing concern amongst parents. I mean, you get 26 sets of parents saying my child hasn't come home from school yet. And word sort of begins to spread, you know, neighbor to neighbor. Oh, mine aren't back yet either. Okay. So a few calls are placed to police. And of course, the first things that they have to consider is things like, has there been an accident? I mean, has the bus driven off the road? Or is there something else blocking the bus getting into the village? But then they realise, well, that can't be right because all the other school buses have made it back. It's just this one that hasn't returned. I mean, if you're these parents, you're going to start to lose your mind. You'd be going a bit nuts at this point. So back at the crime scene, or this particular part of the crime scene, the kids and Ray are bundled into the two vans and the long drive begins. The two new vans that they're put into had been constructed on the inside by the kidnappers to essentially feel like prisons. It was awful. There was wood panelling on the sides and on the roof and the windows had been painted over so that you couldn't see out or in fact see in and so they set off for a very long drive 12 hours in fact this was a part of the kidnappers plan disorientate them keep them confused keep them in the back of these two vans for so long, drive around and around until all sense of direction is lost. During the 12 hours that they're in the back of these vans, there is no water, 
There's no food and there's no way to access a toilet for anyone. And the kids have become really terrified. Ray himself is terrified. He's trying to rally up the older kids and tell them that, look, I'm going to really need your help here in this situation. Like, yes, he is the adult, but he needs them to look after the smallest of the children, who by now are crying and shouting for their parents. After 12 hours of driving, the vans will eventually come to a stop, and they'll come to a stop 100 miles away from where they started from where they abandoned the school bus. And where they've ended up was yet another calculated and very deliberate place. It's a quarry. It's full of rocks, machinery, debris, and it's, it's quiet. It's the middle of the night. And it's a dead silent. The quarry workers had gone home for the day hours ago and the quarry was locked. So if it's locked, how on earth are they going to get in? Well, Fred Woods has a key to open the quarry. Why? Because this quarry belonged to his father. It was a part of the family business. And so when they had been planning all of this, Fred Woods knew that accessing it wouldn't be hard. Getting the keys to open up this quarry would not be difficult for Fred. Okay, as if what these kids have been through is not horrendous enough already, it's going to get worse. The two vans are driven up to one particular part of the quarry. And it's here that the three men open the back doors of the van and they take their captives out, one by one, still pointing their guns so that nobody gets out of hand. They take their captives one by one and they lead them towards a hole in the ground. And when they see this hole in the ground, they're told that they have to climb down. They have to climb down into this hole which has been dug by the kidnappers. This hole goes down 12 feet. The kidnappers start forcing the kids down this hole. And when they get to the bottom, what they realise the kidnappers have put underground is a truck. A large, large ex-army truck that's big enough for 27 people to be held in all at once. So maybe that year of planning doesn't seem so silly. I mean, getting a truck buried 12 feet under the ground must have taken some amount of work from these men to do that. And this is exactly where we are right now. They have their 27 kidnap victims exactly where they want them. Out of sight. Nobody can hear them scream. Nobody would even think. You wouldn't even think to look there. Yeah, you just would not think. A school bus has gone missing. 27 people have been kidnapped. Where might they be? Oh, I know underground. You j I, I just don't think you would... I just don't think you would reach that conclusion. Now, unlike the, the van that they were transported here in, the kidnappers had planned slightly better and had provided a little bit of water, small amount of food, and they'd, they'd put these holes in the floor of the van to be used as, as toilets. And mattresses. They put mattresses in the back of this massive truck for the victims to sleep on. And again, let's just go back to Ray. I mean, the poor guy is freaking out. He's speaking to 14-year-old Michael. And he's asking, do you have any ideas on how we might get out of this? And to be fair, 
it just looks pretty hopeless. The kids are now starting to get sick and really soil themselves and the whole situation is just a mess. Back in Chowchilla, parents and police are now just beyond frantic. Something is very, very wrong. The bus that was carrying their kids has been discovered empty and everyone is losing their mind. I suppose what's even more terrifying in that I was thinking is even if you had the the uh, you know the desire in that moment to be like right we're going to pull everyone we know together and we're going to get out on foot and we're going to go looking for them where would you go like where would you start that that search you would want you would have the desire and the want to start it somewhere but where on earth would you even start looking you wouldn't be thinking perhaps they're a hundred miles away from here buried underground in a quarry so what of the three kidnappers well, by this point, their plan is, is going perfectly. All they need to do now is execute the next part, and that is to ask for the ransom for the safe return of the kids. Now, at first, they had considered $2.5 million. Just to be clear here, they weren't thinking the parents would pay $2.5 million. They assumed that the state would pay $2.5 million. It would come from government money to get these kids back. I don't know if maybe what they thought is, well, maybe I don't know if they thought there might be some kind of appeal or there might be some way that the the government would try and raise this money, but whatever, doesn't matter. They just assumed that, that they would be paid. And for these kidnappers, this was just meant to be quick. This was meant to be a short kidnapping. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure how you estimate time for a kidnapping, but what I mean is, they hadn't planned like that this would go on for a week or anything. They wanted this short and sharp. In their plans, they were like, we kidnap them on this day, and in under 48 hours, these kids are back. And you might be wondering, how do I know that information? Well, let me tell you this. Back in Chowchilla, the phones at the police station are, like, ringing off the hook. And obviously, now across California, police have jumped into action and more and more officers and more police stations are involved. So the bus was hijacked at 4pm the day before and now it's, like, 8am the following day. So police are trying to jump into action, but this is unknown territory. A kidnapping of this scale has never been seen, so it's quite new for police. And so many calls are flooding in to the police station, but one call comes in, and it's from someone who remains anonymous. And they want to pass over to police an important name. They want the name Fred Woods to be known to police. This is the very first time police have ever heard this name. So who is this guy, they're thinking? And the anonymous caller says, I overheard Fred Woods and two of his other deadbeat friends boasting about how they had a plan to make millions and it involved kidnap. And I'm just wondering if this could be connected. So the thing is, police have actually got very, very little to go on. So they have to follow this up. And what they do is they go to the home of Fred Woods which is actually his parents' house, a big fancy home, and they ask, can they look around? Obviously, Mr and Mrs Woods are like, what the bejesus is going on? Why are you looking at our son involved in this? Like, that's ridiculous. And police explain, look, his name has been mentioned, we just need to do a bit of a check. They go down into the basement of the Woods family home. They start looking round... Now, the family basement is where Fred would sometimes hang out with his friends. So they start going through drawers, they start pulling open cupboards and cabinets to see what they can find. And what they're going to find is very interesting in terms of piecing this all together. Okay, here's where we are, story-wise. We've got three strands to this now. We've got three focuses We've got the victims trapped in the underground truck. We've got the three kidnappers and their plan. 
and we've got the police search. Let's go to that truck. It's now a horror scene. Kids are vomiting everywhere. It's stuffy. It's dark. The only source of air that's coming in is from some pipe which has been rammed into the roof and it leads up to ground level. And it's while looking up at this pipe and looking up at the top of the truck that Ray notices something which is going to make his heart sink. The roof of the truck is beginning to cave in. The weight of the rocks and the pebbles the men have placed on top to cover the truck is causing the roof to collapse. And Ray knows that only means one thing. Unless he can do something fast, along with 26 children, he will be buried alive when that roof collapses. Back at the Woods family home, police have found some very interesting documents in a drawer in the basement. They discovered a pile of papers written in Fred Wood's handwriting, which details the kidnapping. It details the timings, the where, the when. It's got drawings of a map. It's got a route. And he's titled it, The Plan. <laughs> Excellent. Well done, Fred. <laughs> no one's going to crack that code. There's also a ransom note, or a very early attempt at one. It's, it's a draft of, of what they think they will later give to police. And in this version that they had started their very early draft, it says this. Your bus has been kidnapped. Put two and a half million dollars in two different suitcases. Use old bills. Have it ready to collect at the Oakland police station. Further instructions pending. We are Beelzebub. You had a year and a half and that's the best you could come up with. Absolute pish. I could have written better than that in my sleep. So, police are receiving up to about 200 calls an hour about the story. And that's coming from... Parents calling for updates, there's press calling for info, other police stations. It's Their phone lines are in meltdown, basically. The parents have gathered together to create a massive search party and people from all over the town have come out to volunteer their time. The problem is, they don't know where to start. In the truck, underground, Ray begins to form a plan. It's not a great plan, but it's all that he has to work with. He gets the help of Michael, the 14-year-old, and some of the older kids. And what they do is they begin to pile up the mattresses, one on top of the other, until they reach the roof of the truck. Now, when it's near the top, Ray pushes Michael up to the very top of the pile of mattresses to where the air pipe is the pipe that's coming in from outside. And with enough force and with enough encouragement, Michael begins to move that pipe until he can create a big enough hole in the roof of the truck. But I mean, this is a risk. This is a real risk. The whole thing could just collapse in on them at any time, but it's a risk they are going to have to take. It takes nearly two hours for Michael to get a hole big enough in the roof that he can get out of it. I mean, that must have taken some sheer amount of strength from that 14-year-old to really move that pipe until he can get a hole that's big enough. And when he gets up through the hole in the roof of the truck, he's in 12 feet of debris and ground, basically that's been placed on top of the truck and he has to start climbing up towards ground level. Now as soon as he starts climbing up, what Ray begins to do is he piles the children on top of the mattress one by one, encouraging them to go through the hole, follow Michael, just stay close to someone else 
and keep going until you can see the top. Look for light. And this is a really slow process. It means 26 bodies you're trying to get through one hole in the roof towards ground level. But this is what they have to do. So what about the kidnappers? Well, the three men are nearby. They haven't checked on the truck at all. I mean, as far as they're concerned, they've buried it. And now all they need is their money. They will reveal where the truck is and everyone will be returned to safety. So, they're going to call police. They put the call in. This is the moment. The moment when it's all going to come together. But here's the snag. Every time they call police, they can't get through. They just keep getting an engaged tone. So many people are calling the police station, they end up trying other police stations, and the same thing happens. They can't get through. So they're frustrated by this and they start to panic. They need to get to police and demand their ransom. They've got people bloody buried underground. And it's funny because I think that they think at this point, but it's fine because we're here. Nobody is going to be thinking about this quarry. Not a person knows that we're here. So we can buy ourselves a bit of time if we just can't quite get through to the police right now. But little do they know, when the police have looked through those early, early versions of the plan that they found in the basement, there's mention of the quarry. And police now know exactly where they need to go. The three kidnappers are also feeling something else, and that is tired. They've been awake for nearly two days now. And so, the three men, they fall asleep near the buried truck. Back with the kidnapped victims, Ray and Michael are doing their best to get each child out and up to ground level. I think what must have been so scary as well at this point is, they don't know that if they actually do manage to get them out, get them up there, what if the kidnappers are standing at the top with guns? What are they going to do? Again, what else can they do? They can't just sit there and wait. All that needs to happen now is that the kids need to just get up to ground level. A shaft of light begins to appear above Michael's head and he clears a bit of the ground and he realises he has reached the top. And he sends a message back down through the kids to tell Ray. And Ray's advice is this. Send one of the small ones who can fit through the gap that you've made up into the quarry and tell them that they must be very, very quiet. Very quiet. They must look around and see if they can see anyone. And they must come back and report to you straight away. So Michael does this, he picks one of the eight-year-old boys small enough to, to sort of fit through the, the rocks. He pushes him through. This eight-year-old comes up onto ground level and the quarry is dead silent. And he whispers to Michael, I can't see them. And so, Michael now just begins to send more and more kids up through the gap. So one by one, they're all beginning to come through. Back down in the truck, Ray is picking them up, throwing them on top of the mattress and sending them up, telling them they have to be quiet. Just wait, just wait until you get to Michael at the top. Ray is the last person to reach ground level. And he looks around, of course, aware that the men might appear at any moment. But they won't, because the kidnappers are still asleep. One of the kids spots a light, which looks a bit like a torchlight, and, and wanders towards it. And it's a guard. It's the quarry guard. He's arrived for his shift. And this guard sees, wandering towards him, an eight-year-old covered in dirt and dust. And of course, he's absolutely shocked, but very quickly puts two and two together and realises what he's seeing. He's now seeing all these kids wandering around the quarry. And he says to the young girl who's wandered towards him, 
The world has been looking for you. This guard immediately calls police. Now, luckily, police are very close by, thanks to the note in the basement. And when they arrive, they see all of the kidnapped victims in the quarry. The three men, they wake up really quickly. They try to run, but the police get to them. Fred Woods, James and Richard Schoenberg are put into handcuffs and taken away to be interviewed. Immediately, police send word back to Chowchilla the kids have been found. They're alive, and aside from being dehydrated, hungry and scared, they aren't hurt. At this point, police decide they need, they need somewhere safe to take the kids, and the closest place is a rehab centre, actually. And so, all 27 of them are taken to this rehab centre, where the kids are wrapped in blankets, they're given apples, sweets and cans of fizzy drink. One by one, the kidnapped victims are examined by a medical team, who determine that aside from some cuts and some bruises, none of them are seriously physically harmed. Back home in Chowchilla, of course, all the parents want is their kids back, but they're going to have to just wait a little bit. Police are doing a thorough job here of, of checking the kids. Eventually, after a few hours, they're taken out of the rehab clinic and they're put on to <laughs> another bus. What a nightmare it must have been. <laughs> imagine, imagine all that time you've been on a school bus, 12 hours in the back of a van, then you've been in an underground truck and now someone's like, here we go, we're back on the bus. But anyway, it's the only way that they can get them back to their parents. And this is it, this is the good news. They're heading home now. They are heading home. And by the time they get to Chowchilla, hundreds of people have gathered to see the kids return. And when the bus pulls in, the parents run towards the bus. They grab their kids, they're hugging them, they're kissing them. Ray is immediately put on camera and made to talk live on the news. And he, he's trying to sort of describe the events, but... He's in shock, he's exhausted. One by one, the parents take their kids home and they start the process of trying to get over the nightmare that they've just had. At the police station, the three men are interviewed separately. They don't even really try to deny it or deviate from exactly what happened. They have to confess. A team arrives at the quarry to begin the task of unearthing the underground truck. And for the next month, it is crazy times in Chowchilla. Everyone wants an interview with these kids, with Ray, with the Woods family, with anyone connected to this story. Camera crews, journalists, everywhere. And then, over time, bit by bit, this begins to fade away and some kind of normality begins to arrive. I started thinking about this bit and I was like, so interesting because if this was now, of course, what would be happening is all of those kids would be seeing therapists. You know, that would just be standard practice now. You would have child psychologists involved. But <laughs> this is 1976 and all that, so you know, we maybe didn't know about PTSD or the many mental health issues that kids could face in the future from something traumatic in childhood. So in 1970s style, <laughs> they decide they know what's going to make the kids much, much better. A trip to Disneyland. <laughs> I mean, I'm laughing, right? But in a way, there's a sweet kind of attempt. You know, they're making a sort of attempt there. I mean, if this was, like I said, if this was 2020, you literally would have them all seeing a therapist. But in the 1970s, apparently a trip to see Mickey and Minnie Mouse <laughs> was just what the doctor ordered. So, I mean, this is what they believe. They believe that if you could send this image out into the world of the kids, you know, on a roller coaster at Disneyland, everyone would go, oh, isn't that really lovely? Those kids are all fine now. 
And there's a kind of naivety about that 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 I can understand. But the story, of course, just wouldn't go away with a, a trip to Disneyland. There was still the court case to go. And all three men were found guilty in that court case. They were each sentenced to life in prison with the chance of parole. And as so often is the case, the three men did not speak to each other ever again. The two brother kidnappers, well, they were quite well behaved in prison. They claimed that, you know, their sort of defence along this whole entire thing was, it was a joke. It was just a joke and it went too far. And that, you know, Fred Woods was the mastermind. He made us do it. He was the man behind all of this. My arse, that old excuse is so boring. Let's pray that I never get myself caught up in some sort of hideous crime. But if I ever try and use the excuse, oh, it was all just a bit of a joke and I wasn't really... And someone else came along and they actually was the person that was really in charge of it and I just kind of went along with it. You have the right to find me and slap me hard across the face and say, shut up, Barry. Those are the kind of dickheads you hate. And and it's true. I do. I hate that. I hate that. Oh, I, I just thought it was all a joke and... Oh, boring. These people are idiots if, if you genuinely think that people will believe that. Anyway, in 2012, James Schoenfield was released. In 2017, Richard Schoenfield was released. Meaning that both brothers served around 35 nearly 40 years for their crimes. But what of Fred Woods, the mastermind? Well, he's still in prison. Fred Woods has tried, get this, 19 times to be paroled. But he's not an easy prisoner and he keeps getting caught doing stupid things in prison and so his parole keeps being denied. But most importantly, what of the victims? What of those kids, some of whom are now in their 50s and some are older than that? The kids were studied years later by child psychologists who discovered that common things among the kids were panic attacks, nightmares, personality changes, Sudden fears of things that they had never been scared of before. A large number of the kids went on to have substance abuse issues. Let's try and find a bit of a positive towards the end. And, you know, I think we should take one moment to shine a light on Ray. That poor bloody bus driver and everything he went through. After the media stuff had died down, Ray was hailed a hero by the parents, the teachers, the police, and he was given an award by the state of California for outstanding bravery and community service. Ray died in 2012, and before he died, Almost every child who had been on that bus made a trip to see him as he was dying in the hospital. Every February 26th in Chowchilla is now Edward Ray Day. And so ends the story of what was, at the time, the largest kidnapping in history. Okay, well, there you go. (laughs) Honestly, as I was researching that, as I was looking at it, even as I was saying it and telling it, I'm like, this is bonkers. What a bonkers fucking story. Imagine kidnapping that number of people. My God. Yeah, and I know that maybe now this sort of thing, well, I don't think it's commonplace. <laughs> it's not like it happens every day, is it? But you know what I mean? Like, it will have happened 
in time and were maybe less shocked about it but at the time that must have been like whoa what are you talking about that amount of people yeah it's a real shame that so many of them went on to develop substance abuse or need support in their life or mental health issues just because of that stupid stupid plan well let it be a lesson to you the next time you're sitting with your friends and one of them says do you know what I've got an idea to get really rich really quickly just say stop there I'm going to tell you about three men who once said the same thing and look how that ended up alright I'm out of here Remember, if you want to get in touch, Twitter, Instagram, join the Facebook group. It would be lovely to chat to you. There's merchandise, and also I have Patreon if you want more stories. All right, until the next time, stay well, all of my love, okay, goodbye. It didn't affect me really one way or the other. <laughs> Alfie, could you be quiet, please? I'm trying to tell a story. Oh, <laughs> That's Alfie dreaming, by the way. <laughs> Think in his dream he's maybe chasing a rabbit or something. If I had a video camera right now, I could show you. Well, I don't have one, but if I did... If, you, if I lifted up the, the curtains, eh, the curtains, <laughs> if I lifted up the duvet, because he's under the duvet in the bed, what he would be doing is he would be running in his sleep, chasing something, and he makes that <laughs> sound when he does it. <laughs> anyway, he's decided to stop stealing by thunder, so I'll go back to the story. <laughs> I would imagine from the look on his face. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over.